But now we're going to have our guest speaker. I'd like uh, to welcome uh, Senator Mark Daly. A humbling honour to be on this hallowed ground a hundred years to the day when Eamon Kant, uh, Michael Mallon, uh, Sean Houston and Carl Convert were uh, put in this unmarked mass grave. We especially remember and pay tribute to their families whose loss of their loved ones uh, we can never imagine. They too, many of those families, went on, as Lincoln said, to give their last full measure of devotion to the cause of Irish freedom. Father, uh, Malin's father was second in command to James Connolly uh, in the Irish Citizens Army. And when he wrote in his last letter to his family, uh, he spoke to Joseph directly when he wrote, he said, Father, uh, he said, Joseph, be a priest if you can, my little man, and Joseph continues to be a priest today and doing great work. I'm delighted to be on the 1916 Commemoration Committee for the Government. I must say it was hard work for five years. Uh, they seem to have lost their way halfway through, but thankfully I think the celebrations were something we could all be proud of. And one of the requests we put in, which you will see next uh, week in, in Washington, is we asked them to put a garden of remembrance on Capitol Hill which will be dedicated on the 18th of May this year. Permission like that has only been granted four times in the last 100 years. So, and that will be to honor 1916 and the leaders and the people we honor here today. But going better than that, I was in Washington uh, last year and we're taking a tour of, of the city and uh, we went to the Washington Monument and uh, there are 103 plaques inside the Washington Monument from different states, organizations and countries who give money towards the funding of the completion of the monument. And when the question was asked by myself, where is the Irish plaque, we were informed there is no Irish plaque. And the reason there's no Irish plaque is because Britain would not allow any of its colonies to give money towards the building of the monument for the general who defeated them. So we wrote to well, I wrote to the director of the National Park Service and I said in light of the 100th anniversary of the 1916 Rising and in light of the fact that 40% of George Washington's army were of Irish heritage and that uh, the only country outside of Ireland mentioned by name in the 1916 proclamation is America when it says supported by our exiled children in America would there be any chance that you would allow a replica of the 1916 proclamation put inside the Washington Monument. The director of the National Park Service in a nice letter wrote back to me and said, there are strict criteria in which we will allow plaques to be in the Washington Monument. We have been asked numerous thousands of times that a plaque will be put in, uh, but on this occasion, we'd like to say that we will grant Ireland the request. So there will be a, a 1916 proclamation put inside the Washington Monument. To, to quote Robert Kennedy in a different context, but the meaning is just the same. It is from numerous diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these can build up a tidal wave that will bring down the mightiest wall of oppression. The acts of the leaders of 1916 was such an act of courage and belief which helped to bring down that mighty wall of oppression. George Bernard Shaw, a great Irish writer, summed up an approach to life. He said, some people see things and say, why? But I dream of things that never were, and I say, why not? It is that quality that we need now more than ever. A combination of hope and determination. These were the qualities of the men and women of 1916, the qualities of previous generations who struggled for freedom against seemingly impossible odds. To quote the proclamation, in every generation, the Irish people have asserted their right to national freedom and sovereignty. Six times during the past 300 years, they have asserted them in arms. O'Neill and O'Donnell in 1602, Sarsfield in 1690, the boys of Wexford in 1798, Lord Edward Fitzgerald in 1803, the Young Islanders in 1848, 
and the Fenians in 1867. No other nation in history has such a record. In each century, in each generation, stood up in turn against seemingly impossible odds, but only to have that quest renewed by the succeeding generation, only to have the flag passed on to the next generation. On Easter Monday, 1600, men and women rose out, taking on the biggest standing army the world had ever seen. On the continent, a day's sail from Dublin, Britain and her allies mobilized in the entire course of the war 17 million men. And taking on these odds, odds of 11,000 to 1, they were taking on an empire on which the sun never set. It couldn't control the lives of one in four people on the planet at that time. It controlled 13 million square miles, 25% of the surface of the earth. Against these odds, these ordinary yet extraordinary men and women did an extraordinary thing on that ordinary day. They took on an empire bigger than Rome and they dealt it a fatal blow. Little did the British authorities realize at the time that what should have been just a footnote in the history of World War I was in fact the beginning of the end of the British Empire. The flag that the volunteers raised on that Easter Monday, and which we will raise here in a moment, was created by a man from Waterford, Thomas Francis Marr. He was the epitome of that self-belief that we must have in ourselves today. Marr came back from France in 1848 with two good ideas. The first one was rebellion. And for his leadership in the rise of 1848, he was put on trial for high treason. And the judge asked him, had he anything to say before passing sentence, to which Marr replied, well, your honor, I will give you my word as a gentleman that if you do not sentence me to death, I will try again. <laughs> Marr was sentenced to death, but he was commuted to transportation for life to Australia. And he was sitting in Richmond prison where the leaders of 1916 were sentenced to be executed in 1849 and he wrote his last letter from Ireland in which he said never was there a country so downcast so pitiful so spiritless yet I cannot but hope for her regeneration nations do not die in a day they encompass centuries their vitality is inextinguishable 160 years ago at the height of the famine Thomas Francis Marr had a faith enough to believe that not only would the Irish people survive but they would triumph and it is that spirit that we must have in ourselves now. Thomas Francis Marr's second good idea when he came back from France in the summer of 1840, it was he designed a flag for a nation based on the concept of the French flag. And he spoke about it when he said, the white in the center signifies a lasting truce between orange and green. And I trust between its foes, the hands of Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants will be clasped in generous and heroic brotherhood. The hope of brotherhood, the hope of tone and of the United Irishmen is closer today than ever. And it is the sacred trust of this generation and future generations to make that noble cause a reality. It was that flag that was raised over the GPO in 1916, the colors of which had the same meaning then as they do now. And as the flag was raised, Pierce wrote, read from the proclamation, the contents of which is a statement of intent, a contract with the people and a solemn pledge. In it he spoke about how Ireland should be, and that continues to be our challenge today. The Republic guarantees civil and religious liberties, equal rights, equal opportunities to all its citizens, and declares the resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all its parts. This was the Ireland and the Republic that the leaders of 1916 wanted to, to achieve before their lives were cut short. The work of each generation is to fulfill the promise of the proclamation. The challenge of each generation is to span the distance between the ideals as set out in the proclamation and the realities of the world in which we find ourselves in. The hope is that each new generation will carry the flag to create an Ireland where all the aims of the proclamation are fulfilled. And finally, Though we are in difficult times, I believe, as other 
believe before me that we can, we shall, and we will prevail again. Gorham Margaret.